the first notice for Starship Flight 11 is now out, thanks to a local notice to mariners covering the launch portion of the mission. From the looks of it, SpaceX is aiming for no earlier than October 6th, with a launch window opening at 6.15 p.m. CDT and lasting about an hour. If that timing holds, the gap between Flight 10 and Flight 11 will be just shy of 41 days, only 15 minutes away from hitting that mark exactly. While not quite a record, it comes close. The fastest turnaround so far was 37 days, 9 hours, and 35 minutes between flights 5 and 6. Now you might be wondering, what's the game plan for flight 11 and how does it stack up against the others? Let's dig in. Overall, Flight 11's profile looks much like the last two suborbital test flights. The trajectory will once again be suborbital, aiming for a high altitude climb followed by a controlled splashdown. The pair flying this round are Ship 38 and Booster 15-2, the latter being a reused booster that first flew on Flight 8. But this time, Flight 11 is set to climb even higher somewhere between 210 and 230 kilometers, or maybe more. That's the highest point yet compared to Flight 10's peak of 192 kilometers. So why the extra push? The reason is simple, to test deploying 20 Starlink version 3 mock-up satellites. To deploy satellites properly, you need to hit at least 200 kilometers, and ideally higher, so they can settle into stable orbits go any lower and they just lose altitude and tumble back to Earth. By pushing to this altitude, Starship will prove it's not just capable of flying up and back down. It can actually place satellites into orbits where they can circle Earth the way they're supposed to. Climbing that high also means Starship's return will be much tougher. Dropping from space instead of a lower altitude exposes it to hotter temperatures and stronger air pressure, making this a real stress test for the heat shield. That's why SpaceX is taking a more cautious approach this time, fully installing and using the upgraded ceramic heat shield tiles for a complete re-entry trial, unlike Flight 10, where some tiles were intentionally left out. For Flight 11, Ship 38 will feature the crunch wrap system at full scale. This system works like a special wrapping layer around each tile, sealing the gaps to keep heat out more effectively. It's seen as a simpler and smarter alternative to the traditional gap fillers NASA used on the Space Shuttle. After showing solid performance during Flight 10, SpaceX decided to cover the entire vehicle with it for Flight 11, aiming for even better sealing and overall tile protection. And this is only the start. Future flights will bring even more innovations, with the company confirming ongoing work in test envelope expansion and aerodynamic improvements. All of these steps are key to handling the harsher re-entry conditions and keeping the rocket safe as it comes back through the atmosphere. It's not just about the heat shield. Flight 11 is also a test of how Starship handles itself at higher altitudes, including stability, guidance, and velocity profiles. Looking ahead, 2026 is shaping up to be a critical year with heavier missions on the schedule, including a demonstration of orbital refueling with Starship version 3 at altitudes between 200 and 400 kilometers. Alongside those primary goals, there are secondary objectives too. Instead of deploying eight dummy satellites like the last mission, this time Starship will attempt to deploy 20 full-size Starlink version 3 mock-ups. That big jump in payload is designed to stress test the vehicle under heavier loads. Reports suggest these mock-ups were likely moved into the Star Factory earlier in September. Here's the exciting part. During Flight 10, deploying just eight satellites took around five minutes. With 20 on Flight 11, we can expect at least 10 minutes of deployment footage. And finally, Flight 11 is essentially a refined version of Flight 10, with key upgrades to the engine section to prevent a repeat of a serious issue. Back in August, during Flight 10, the system suffered a sudden rupture when one of the engine chill lines, pipes that send liquid nitrogen to cool the Raptors before ignition, failed. Under the intense heat and pressure of plasma re-entry, 
that line likely gave way from thermal stress or a pressure spike, causing an overpressure event that tore open part of the aft skirt and scattered debris. Despite the damage, the vehicle impressively held together and managed a controlled splashdown in the Indian Ocean, proving just how tough Starship really is. For Flight 11's Ship 38, SpaceX has already rolled out important upgrades. The chill lines have been swapped out for stronger materials built to handle higher heat and pressure, and real-time pressure sensors have been added to catch issues before they become critical. The landing plan builds on what worked in Flight 10, with improvements to the splashdown sequence, most notably the flip maneuver to reorient before touching down softly in the ocean. As always, the hope is that Ship 38 can survive splashdown and be hauled back for inspection. Pulling that off would be a major milestone, showing that Starship is edging closer to becoming truly reusable. And ultimately, Flight 11 will serve as the answer to a big question. Is Starship ready to move on to version 3? Flight 11 marks the end of the version 2 era. According to SpaceX executive Bill Gerstenmeier, this means they won't be packing in as many experimental techniques. Instead, the focus is shifting toward the setup they plan to fly next year. By 2026, SpaceX will move to version 3 for both the ship and the booster. This upgrade includes a new Raptor engine with greater performance than the current models. The plan is to first fly version 3 on suborbital tests, and if those succeed, the following version 3 flights could target orbit. That sets the stage for an orbital attempt no earlier than Flight 13. At the same time, Elon Musk has hinted that SpaceX will likely try to catch and recover a Starship at Starbase somewhere between Flights 13 and 15, depending on how the next few tests play out. So, if SpaceX plans to bring both stages back to the launch site, what exact trajectory would Starship need to fly for a full round trip? The answer may have been outlined in the FAA's Draft Tiered Environmental Assessment, released this September. Unlike rockets launched over the open Atlantic from Cape Canaveral, Florida, vehicles leaving South Texas have to follow a very narrow flight corridor to avoid populated landmasses downrange. For the upper stage, Starship's re-entry would begin over the Northeast Pacific Ocean, north of the Hawaiian Islands. From there, the flight path stretches east and southeast, narrowing as it approaches northern Mexico before finally targeting Starbase in South Texas. There are two corridor zones in Starship's re-entry corridor that provide flexibility for navigation and safety. The primary corridor, represented by the red zone, is the main planned path for Starship's descent. This corridor is designed for the safest, most efficient trajectory back to Starbase, allowing Starship to slow down and prepare for a precise vertical landing. It carefully navigates over the Northeast Pacific Ocean and parts of northern Mexico before reaching Texas. The secondary corridor, shown as the yellow zone, acts as a buffer or contingency area. This zone provides extra space for any necessary navigational adjustments or deviations caused by weather system performance, or unexpected in-flight events. It ensures Starship has room to safely alter its path without endangering populated areas or creating hazards to air traffic. One more key detail, all Starship landings are planned for daylight hours. That's almost certainly a safety measure since Starship landings are far more complex than those of Falcon 9 or even Super Heavy. Daylight gives ground crews and tracking systems the best visibility to monitor and support the landing. Meanwhile, the Super Heavy booster has two possible return corridors over the Atlantic, varying by mission, with air traffic disruptions that require management. One point northeast, passing over Florida and out into the open Atlantic, while the other heads southeast through the narrow strait between Mexico and Cuba, continuing past Jamaica before entering the Atlantic. This dual path setup suggests that Super Heavy's return could shift based on mission needs or environmental conditions. But just like with SHIP, these options bring major air traffic challenges. 
the FAA's analysis shows that the booster's operating area averages around 200 aircraft per hour. With 22 launches planned annually, each one could affect anywhere from 133 to 400 flights. That adds up to about 2,926 to 8,800 potentially impacted flights every year. Those figures are higher than for the ship's return corridor, which makes sense given the heavier air traffic in the eastern Atlantic region. The FAA also points out a key difference between ship and booster returns. While ship landings won't happen at night, super heavy landings may occasionally be scheduled after dark. The plan allows for about three nighttime operations per year. During those windows, air traffic density in the affected airspace would be much lower, averaging around 10 flights per hour. Still, each night landing could disrupt anywhere from 7 to 120 flights, adding up to between 21 and 360 impacted flights annually. In addition to Starship's news, let's talk about the recent activities on SpaceX's other workhorse. At the time of this report, SpaceX was preparing to launch three spacecraft on a first-of-its-kind mission to study how the sun affects the solar system, from Earth's atmosphere all the way to the edge of interstellar space. Riding inside Falcon 9's payload fairing are NASA's Interstellar Mapping and Acceleration Probe, IMAP, NOAA's Space Weather Follow-On SWFOL-1 spacecraft, and NASA's Carruthers Geocorona Observatory. The three satellites are headed to the Earth-Sun Lagrange Point 1 L1, a stable spot in constant sunlight about 930,000 miles, 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. While each mission has its own goals, together they aim to give us a clearer understanding of the Earth-Sun connection. IMAP is the first spacecraft built specifically to map the outer boundary of the heliosphere. The giant magnetic bubble created by the solar wind that surrounds our solar system. Equipped with 10 instruments developed by U.S. teams and 27 international partners, IMAP will track solar wind, interstellar dust, and charged particles, while also delivering continuous solar weather data. From their L1 vantage point, IMAP and its companion spacecraft will be the first to observe solar activity directly and are designed to provide 30 to 60 minutes of advance warning for dangerous radiation storms heading toward Earth. This capability is especially critical for astronaut missions beyond low Earth orbit where Earth's magnetosphere no longer provides strong radiation shielding. NASA already has two such missions on the horizon. Artemis II, a crewed flight around the Moon in 2026, and Artemis III, a lunar landing in 2027. Flying with IMAP NOAA's SWFOL-1 will act as a dedicated solar warning system, tracking space weather and energetic particles in real time. Its data will flow directly into NOAA's forecasting models to help protect satellites, communication networks, and power grids from the impacts of geomagnetic storms. NASA's Carruthers Geocorona Observatory, previously known as the Global Lyman Alpha Imagers of the Dynamic Exosphere, is tasked with studying Earth's exosphere, a thin atmospheric layer that extends nearly halfway to the Moon. 